Provincial health ministers met this week with their federal counterpart to begin the long road to a new health care funding deal. One group that's watching the events carefully is the Canadian Medical Association, which represents the country's 83,000 doctors. Dr. Granger Avery is the newly elected president of the CMA, and he joins us now via Skype from Montreblanc, Quebec, for his take on this week's meetings and what he sees as the big health care issues on the horizon. Uh, Dr. Avery, first of all, congratulations on your new appointment. Are congratulations in order? Definitely. This is uh, a seminal time in uh, Canadian healthcare. It's fabulous to be here. Okay. Let's play a clip off the top here of the federal health minister's comments coming out of the meetings this week, and then we'll chat after that. Sheldon, roll the clip if you would. We're giving substantial investments in health uh, through a f large variety of mechanisms, not just the Canada Health Transfer, and we want any investments in health to go to health. There are countries in this world, and there are many of them, developed countries, uh, OECD countries that are getting far better value for money than we are. We pay some of the highest costs in the world for health care, and we've got a middle-of-the-road health care system. I want to get your reaction to a couple of things that she just said there. For example, we in Canada have a middle-of-the-road health care system. Do you agree? Well, if you look at the international comparisons, I think we would have to accept that we're not doing as well as we could or actually should with our Canadian health care system. For example, the Commonwealth Fund ranks Canadian health care at 10th out of 11 similar countries while ranking our funding, um, the similar 11 countries, at, at fifth. So there's a bit of a mismatch there between what the uh, uh, service is when it's finally delivered to the patient and what we pay for it. She also seemed to allege there that the money that the federal government gives to the provinces and territories to be spent on health care is in fact not being spent on health care. Can you confirm or deny that? Neither. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, that's a matter, I think, for the provincial and federal governments to sort out. There is need, of course, <clears throat> for excuse me, transparency and accountability in our system right throughout the system. So right from what uh, I do as a doctor right up to what the uh, uh, health minister does in the federal field. I think it's accurate to say that the government, while it transfers the money to the provinces with hopes that the provinces will spend it on health care, it's actually just going into the big pool that is the provincial treasury and nobody knows for sure what it's being spent on. Is that accurate? I understand that the um, Canada Health Transfer Funds are accepted into general revenues in the um, provinces and uh, territories. Uh, I heard um, the Minister Hoskins from Ontario yesterday, uh, Tuesday saying that uh, he would vouch safe for all, all of the dollars, every cent, he said, going towards health care. Okay, let's try this. How important do you think it is for patients in this country that the feds and the provinces come to a deal here that satisfies everybody? Essential. How come? There is no, no other way of saying that. We need to move on. Canada, as I referenced earlier with our international comparisons, Canada is lagging behind what we could and what we should do. We must do better. And what if they can't come to an agreement? Oh, they will. I'm, I have every confidence they will come to an agreement. And and let's uh, let's be clear about this. We're, they're talking at the moment about money, and that's fine. That's very important. That's underpinning a lot of what we do. A lot, not all. And and wh what we are suggesting from the Canadian Medical Association is that we actually focus those discussions on what happens to the patients. And we have uh, identified uh, seniors as a particular focus, as they, there are lags in the system that supports seniors. And there's actually uh, specific and probably extensive um, fiscal advantages if we do that. Well, of course, the amount of treatment that you can give to seniors and other patients across the country very much depends on how much money provinces have to spend. And, of course, if they don't get a deal with the federal government, then that is put in question. I think we want to take a second here just to point out what it is that we're talking about, this Canada Health Transfer, because that's the money that they're negotiating over right now. It's an annual per capita cash transfer from the federal government to the provincial governments. Uh, once upon a time when public health care in the country was introduced, the feds and the provinces split those expenditures 50-50. It's been a long time since that was the case. We shifted to annual cash transfers during the 1970s, and today, the Canada Health Transfer covers less than a quarter 
of provincial costs, 50-50 once upon a time, less than a quarter today. In 2004, the transfer was set to a 6% per year increase, year over year, until the year 2016-17. And starting in 2017-18, the increase is to be pegged to the nominal growth rate of the economy. Everybody guessing around 3%. $34 billion was paid out in 2015-16. In 2017-18, if in fact the transfer is less than it was in the past, Ontario says it's going to receive $400 million less from the federal government. And if you look at the country as a whole, it would be a billion dollars less. And I guess my question is, can you do what you want to do in terms of patient care, in terms of dealing with all of the needs of the healthcare system, uh, let's talk about Ontario for now. If the federal government transfers $400 million less than expected to the province of Ontario. Yes, there's, there's, there's two things, as you accurately point out. One is our system and how do we think about uh, making our system more efficient. And the other is the amount of the money that uh, people have to use to support that system. So um, we have heard from the uh, provincial ministers that they require more money, but that's into the status quo. So it does lead us to ask, well, how do we best organize our system? We do have to take pains to point out that we're not talking about a cut here. We're talking about a cut in the rate of increase. So instead of health transfers going up 6%, as they have been, they would only go up 3%. And I guess there will be some people uh, who say 3% year over year is still above inflation and you ought to be able to do what you want to do on that. Is that accurate? Well, those arguments have been made. I, I'm, I'm not a, an economist, so I, I can't give you assurance on that, but, but those arguments have certainly been made. I understand that they're being made, but if, if the health transfer is not 6%, but say only, quote unquote, 3%, that's still above inflation, and shouldn't you doctors and shouldn't people who run the healthcare system be able to make do with just that amount? Uh, certainly, it's above the level of inflation. How we organize ourselves and how we um, organize the delivery of healthcare uh, plays a very large part in, uh, in the efficacy and the financial efficiency of, of the system. So, we do need to do both of those things at the same time. Uh, are, I'm wondering how, you're going to forgive this one political aside here, I'm wondering whether you intend, as part of your campaign, to get the health transfer to be bigger than perhaps what the feds want, to point out that it would seem ironic if Stephen Harper were actually to fund health care at 6% increases year over year and Justin Trudeau at 3% year over year. Are you planning to point that out to people? Well, what we've done is we've taken the need of patients, taken the need of Canadians, and tried to help focus the discussion around that need. So um, we did not address the uh, percentage transfers, but we're trying to address where people actually need help. So that's particularly around the seniors, and there are several parts of uh, how we might um, look at assisting seniors' care and uh, with, with medication, uh, et cetera, which I'm sure we can talk about in a moment. Uh, so th there's, there's uh, funding that we think should go where it's necessary for it to go to help our Canadian people. That, sir, is a diplomatic answer. I guess you're in the, you're in the diplomatic corps now, aren't you? <laughs> uh, uh, what I'm doing is I'm... Try to do my best for Canadian people. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Well, the other day, of course, the Trudeau government celebrated its first anniversary in power, and we did a little program here about it. And one of the comments uh, that emerged from that we'd like to play for you right now. Uh, Sheldon, if you would, roll it. The most important thing to Stephen Harper's government was to keep taxes low and to keep the size of government low. And the Liberals have basically ac accepted this. Um, if you look at the revenue projections made by Joe Oliver, in his uh, last budget and the revenue projections made by Bill Morneau, they're the same. So whatever kind of consultations or promises or discussions, and we were already seeing this with the civil, uh, civil public civil uh, unions and with the provinces, there is no more money. All right, the federal government insists, and there are many people across the country who believe that the days of 6% annual increases of health spending are just not on anymore, that there's simply no more money left. Do doctors accept the fact uh, that there is no money left if that's in fact the case? 
We, we've certainly heard, and we heard um, most cogently from Minister Barrett uh, at the um, uh, Health Accord Summit that uh, uh, Canada 2020 and CMA held a couple of weeks back, that we are in fact bumping up into a fiscal ceiling and that the uh, governments uh, on our behalf, on behalf of citizens, are saying that uh, it's not uh, appropriate to spend a whole lot more money on health care. There are other priorities and we need to therefore clearly address how we spend the money and uh, how we go about deciding about that. So, so the, the, this, this clearly brings you back to the how part as well as to the what parts. Understood. Uh, I, I guess Canadians could be forgiven for wondering, you know, what's the big deal around all of this sort of internal plumbing on how stuff gets funded? But let's let's suggest that obviously the amount of money that the federal government is prepared to transfer to provinces to pay for services matters. Uh, when you want to get into that emergency department, when you want that hip replacement, when you want that bypass surgery, etc., etc., etc. So let me ask you, as you look at the whole country, what's the single most urgent requirement? that you would like to see dealt with in the healthcare system that you think a robust federal transfer to the provinces could tackle? Well, CMA has been very clear about this. And we believe that uh, attention to the seniors' care is where, um, uh, if, if you pardon the expression, where the money is, uh, both from the point of view of health care and for fiscal responsibility. So seniors in Canada are now living longer and living better uh, for the most part. And that is an enormous success. That's something to be celebrated. Senior uh, Life expectancy in Canada is now about 10 years more than it was uh, even two or three decades ago. And the numbers of seniors that uh, we have in Canada has increased. The percentages have increased. We now have uh, more seniors at 15% of the population then we have uh, young folks now from the up to the 15 year age group. Uh, so that combined with um, a third more people in Canada means that the system that we set up very appropriately and it did really well for the first few decades, Canada Healthcare uh, set up about 50, almost 60 years ago now, uh, uh, probably uh, needs uh, some retuning. Uh, I've referred to it as uh, pressing the reset button. Let's have another think about how we organize ourselves to deliver care in Canada. Let me follow up on that because that's a great point. Uh, what we've been talking about so far this evening has all to do with money and who pays for what and who transfers how much. But, you know, where the rubber hits the road is, if you're a senior in this country, can you get to see a doctor? If you're a senior in this country, can you get the services that you obviously are going to be needing more of in future? So that speaks presumably to your point about how we organize ourselves. There's nothing in these talks that's going to solve any of that, is there? Well, you put your finger right on it. And if we uh, do address that, which has been the central platform <clears throat> for uh, Canadian Medical Association, let's look at our seniors. Let's look at where the costs lie, where the healthcare needs lie. And then uh, we think it can all fall into place. So we've suggested, for example, a demographic top-up for provinces, and by that we mean uh, acknowledgement of the fact that there are uh, different numbers or different percentages of seniors in different provinces and territories. And when, uh, when the government looks to fund that, uh, that should be paid out according to the number of or percentage of seniors in the province. So that, that's a sort of a fair way of doing things. That's the first piece. So that's, a, if you like, a general unrestricted uh, approach to, hey, let's uh, see what we can do to help seniors within this sphere of whatever you're doing in the province or territory. That's the first piece. Second piece is uh, let's look at some detail on how we can best go about that in addition. So in there, we would include uh, access to long-term care. We have uh, approximately, um, by some estimates, 50% uh, of, uh, of seniors uh, languishing in a, an acute care bed when they are better cared for in long-term care where the services are different and more appropriate to what uh, a person needs in, in that situation or better still, where it's uh, feasible uh, medically, at home. The cost savings, just not even considering for a moment the, uh, the health uh, um, reasons for doing this, but the cost savings are striking. 
uh, there is a tenfold, more or less, increase in cost between long-term care and acute care. And there is a 20-fold increase in costs between uh, home care and acute care. And when you consider, when you put that with the, uh, with the health advantages, why would you not do that? Well, I accept everything you say, except, uh, all right, given that it's still baseball season, I'm going to come back at you with a high and tight pitch here. <laughs> what, do we, what do we do about doctors who don't want to take on seniors as patients because seniors take too much time and they're too difficult to deal with? What do we do about doctors who only want to practice a couple of days a week uh, because it's better for their lifestyle and therefore when a senior needs to get in to see their doctor, they can't? Well, you know, these are matters properly for each province and territory to work through. But in general principles, the uh, concepts of generalism, where, uh, and that's best understood in primary care, um, are, are employed. That's about longitudinality, about service to specific uh, numbers of people, um, about following a patient through from community to hospital, um, and about working in a team. All of those things uh, can increase our, if you like uh, to put it in um, um, economic terms, increase our productivity and, and fundamentally improve our health care and improve the relationships between uh, medicine and uh, our people. Okay, Dr. Avery, uh, I've got a minute left and I want to ask you one last thing and you won't be surprised to hear. I'm interested in your view on what in heaven's name is going on here in the province of Ontario where you've got the leadership of the Ontario Medical Association and the government of Ontario on the same page but two-thirds of the doctors of the province completely offside uh, from what they want, from, meaning the leadership of the OMA and the province, and thinking that uh, the agreement was completely unacceptable and therefore in, uh, in unprecedented fashion, they rejected it. How are we going to get out of that, uh, that pickle? Well, I think it comes back to the collaborative leadership for healthcare design and healthcare um, uh, management. So that's a piece that we haven't tackled properly yet in Canada. That's a fundamental piece. And I, I, I ask if, if it's fair to saddle um, the whole question that making the decisions around the delivery of care and the funding of care, is it fair to saddle that with one sector of society? at the government or perhaps to the government and the doctors uh, i think there needs to be more needs to be more what more people involved more sectors involved uh, the people themselves the universities the healthcare managers they all have a, an essential role to play and unless uh, those sectors are properly consulted i think we will see more of this confrontation because people don't know how to manage it outside that understood uh, dr avery it's good of you to join us on tvo tonight thanks so much Thank you. It's a pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.